The National Hurricane Center sounding the all clear today in both the Atlantic and East Pacific. Nothing expected over the next several days. The teleconnections all trending towards neutral. Full moon coming up in a couple days and that's about all I can tell you for the global and interplanetary weather picture. Let's take a look at what's going on across the U.S. this afternoon. Not very much to look at on the surface analysis this afternoon. One frontal system in the western Great Lakes, another in the northeastern U.S., both of those driving convective complexes. A rather extensive dry line in the high plains extending from Alberta to New Mexico. And a warm front and a new cold front in western Canada. This will bring some big weather changes to the Pacific Northwest over the next couple of days. This time of year, the mid-tropospheric flow still is quite important. There's one of those subtropical highs that we talked about back on Friday, parked right over Gallup, New Mexico. Another subtropical high located about a thousand miles east of North Carolina. In between, some troughiness, and no wonder we have numerous showers and storms in the eastern U.S. Ridging extending through the Alberta prairies, so some rather warm weather there, temperatures well up into the 90s in Montana. And a trough coming onshore in British Columbia, that's supporting that frontal system approaching the northwestern U.S. A cutoff low off the California coast, not really a whole lot of reflection of that at the surface. At the 700 millibar level, about 10,000 feet, going lower and zooming in a little bit more, we get some more of that fine scale structure. There is that subtropical high as seen at 700 millibars. So that right there, that is really not helping much with bringing monsoon moisture into Arizona. You still can get some at the surface, but at this level, it tends to push any moisture away. Uh, if, you're, if you've got tropical moisture approaching from Mexico, it's going to get diverted over into Baja, California. So overall, not a favorable pattern at the moment. We can go ahead and take a look at that monsoon chart. There's that high dew points right around 49 to 50 as indicated by the GFS model here. Then going forward in time, that subtropical high remains parked over Arizona dew points creeping up into the 50s, but not making much headway. 40s for Wednesday and Thursday, and we see a little bit of a shift there in the flow, becoming more northwesterly as that subtropical high backs off towards the west. So yeah, dew points are now starting to come up a little bit. And then going into next week, northerly flow. And if you can get those monsoon storms going, that can be favorable for pushing storms off the higher terrain into the Phoenix area. So this early, it's not really clear if anything like that's going to happen, but we do see the moisture does increase, which is always a good sign. In the Northeast, we have a split between pleasant weather and summer heat. Up in upstate New York and parts of New England, highs are only in the 70s. But up and down the entire Northeast Corridor, we saw 90s earlier this afternoon. Some areas getting relief due to that anvil shield and the outflow itself. Complexes of thunderstorms, one moving into New Jersey and Maryland at the hour, another further to the west moving into Illinois and the St. Louis area. And another one up there in the UP of Michigan, stretching from about Marquette down to Green Bay. The Storm Prediction Center has identified a couple of areas of interest, a slight risk through the Southern Northeast Corridor. That's mostly for gusty winds, pretty much the same story up there in the UP of Michigan, marginal risk. That could have a little bit of hail mixed in and other strong storms out here in the Ozarks into the Corn Belt. There's a current look at the radar out of Philadelphia. These storms are definitely outflowish. Look at that right there. Pushing out about 10 miles from the storms, and typically that does diminish the possibility of tornadoes. There have been a couple of warnings for tornadoes for radar indications and spotter observed funnels, but this is really not a favorable environment. However, that storm right there at the very end, let me skip ahead. That right there, that has a little bit better access to inflow right through there. So that would have to be watched. And that is a cell 
out ahead of the line. And that's a reason you have to watch those convex areas and storms that are ahead of the boundary, which are intensifying further. And another interesting feature down in here, if we run the animation, you can see the sea breeze. That can be another focus for initiation, but nothing going on this evening. A couple of storms out there in the New York City area. It looks like Queens LaGuardia Airport got a little bit of rain and showers there. Other storms through the Poconos and into eastern Pennsylvania. And then further down the line, we switch over to the Washington radar. Yeah, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., this is going to be the proverbial tail end, Charlie. And those storms are not really doing very much. A couple of severe warnings, probably for gusty winds just east of Annapolis. Other isolated cells down to the south, but they don't appear to be doing very much at this time. In the southeastern U.S., a typical July pattern, scattered thunderstorms all through the area, some rather impressive cells closer to that slight risk, and one cell along Interstate 95 south of Raleigh. Look at that thing. That thing is really mushrooming out. Let's take a look at that on the radar. Yeah, I've only got two frames loaded up here, but that's going to be the storm south of Raleigh. So if we want to analyze that for severe weather, we can just go up to the higher tilts. And we're going up higher into the storm, 8,000 feet, 21,000 feet. Pretty good core right here, and we start picking up the anvil shield a little bit further to the south at the higher elevations. And let's see, the highest part of the storm is going to be about... 31,000 feet. That's about as high as the antenna goes. But that's sitting pretty much vertically over the surface core. So this is going to be a little pulse type thunderstorm. Don't really see any severe organization on this at this time. The Texas Hill Country digging out from one of the worst floods on record. The death toll is up to 109, making it one of the worst Texas tragedies in recent memory. The storms did hamper rescue efforts throughout the weekend, but the area is finally starting to see sunshine. Low to mid-90s covered much of Texas, the hot spot Del Rio with 96 and Presidio in the Big Bend with 99. Further up north, a large marginal risk for severe covered much of the southern plains north of I-20 and I-30, including the Panhandles, Oklahoma, the Ozarks. This was mostly for isolated convective wind gusts, some isolated large hail possible on the high plains from Oklahoma to the Rockies. A marginal risk of severe extended from the Panhandles all the way to the Black Hills. The risks primarily for strong winds and large hail. The heat was beginning to crank up in Montana as westerly downslope winds increased Upper 90s covered much of eastern Montana. Billings expected 97 this afternoon, prompting heat advisories. Red flag warnings were in effect for south-central Wyoming today around Rollins due to west winds gusting to 25 miles an hour and relative humidity down to 10%. In the Rockies, we had some hot conditions, 90s and close to 100 in the eastern plains. Grand Junction, 100 degrees, 97 for Salt Lake City. The Mountain Valley, seeing lots of 80s today. Alamosa, climbing to 87. Denver was under a heat advisory today, 98 to 102 expected there. And some high-based storms coming off the front range. Hot across the southwestern U.S. Phoenix up to 113 today. Tucson, 105. And tomorrow, the heat wave will peak. We have extreme heat warnings today, tomorrow, Thursday, all through the lower deserts from Phoenix to Palm Springs, temperatures 108 to 117. In California, we have heat advisories tomorrow and Thursday in the inland areas of San Diego and Los Angeles. Temperatures will be well into the 90s, possibly up to 100, east of a line from Ontario to Murrieta and Escondido. In the Pacific Northwest, they've got some heat going there as well. A cold front is on the way, promising relief in a couple of days. We had some impressive storms in southwestern Oregon last night around Medford. 
The storm briefly had a severe warning for north-central Siskiyou County for 60-mile-an-hour winds and quarter-sized hail. And this is the radar animation for that, showing a very compact little storm moving towards the northwest. A little bit anomalous for this time of year. That's almost a Texas type of storm. And that was probably a strange sight along Interstate 5 last night. This is a close-up look at the storm as it crossed the Oregon state line at 0140Z. Storm relative velocity not really all that impressive. And if we take a look at the cross-section, well, we'll transect it from the inflow into the storm itself. And that does appear to be a little bit of overhang on the leading edge right in here. And if we page through the levels and go up to the higher tilts, you can see that it does lean forward a little bit. So that was probably quite impressive as it bared down. I haven't seen any photos from this, but uh, yeah, right there between Siskiyou and Hornbrook, somewhere in that area. For today, scorching heat, 83 at Seattle, that's scorching for them, 88 at Portland, and 100s in the interior, Pasco 103, Pendleton and Boise up to 102, and some strong storms going up on the Blue Mountains and in the Bitterroots and Salmon River Mountains as well. And we head out into the Pacific and up to Alaska, Stormy and the Bering Sea and the Aleutians, about what we would expect for this time of year. And some big changes for Alaska. A large area of polar air coming out of the Arctic region, surging into the Brooks Range, dropping those temperatures in the interior. Some of that temperature drop is due to precipitation and cloud cover, but much colder air up there in the Brooks Range. Let me see if I have the uh, special Alaska charts. And we do. Low pressure system up there near Arctic Village, cold front extending into the Bering Strait area. And this is the area of cold air advection surging south. And we take it forward through Wednesday. And that's the last frame that I have right there. But that's the cold air coming down, maybe some snow in the higher elevations of the Brooks Range, and some of that cold air trying to work down the Mackenzie River into parts of Canada. That probably could affect the U.S. towards the weekend. No big cold air outbreak, but probably a little surge of summertime cool air coming out of central Canada. And speaking about Canada, we work our way to the east. Some very warm temperatures in this part of the Arctic, right around 68 to 71 at the time we did this map, Kukuruk, which is Pelly Bay, it's this station right here, they are under a heat warning for temperatures to 77 or 25 Celsius for the next two days. Doesn't sound like much, but houses and buildings there are heavily insulated. And outside, you've got heavy populations of gnats and mosquitoes ready to pounce. So that's not really a good situation, indoors or outdoors. That's the uh, dilemma. In the prairies, Smoke is back for the northern prairies. Smoke warnings continue for the LaRange and Thompson area, basically right in here. Air quality statements for the rest of the prairies from Northwest Territories down to uh, Manitoba and east of Winnipeg. We do have smoke warnings there that just came out for today. Let's see, for the rest of Canada, yeah, there is a heat warning for this part of Ontario from north of the Transcan to Hudson Bay. They're looking for temperatures up near 88 degrees, 31 Celsius, and very warm humid X is up to 100 Fahrenheit. No problems in the rest of eastern Canada due to high pressure, but the remains of tropical storm Chantal passing Nova Scotia, producing some heavy rains for the remainder of this evening. All right, it's time to put the maps into motion going into tonight and into tomorrow. These frontal systems continue working through the northeast very slowly, but we're looking for continued severe risks. Focusing on the mid-Atlantic for tomorrow, a slight risk from Charlotte to Philadelphia, including Washington, D.C. and Richmond. Again, this is going to be for high winds. 
In the north-central U.S., we're looking for a slight risk along the South Dakota-North Dakota border. Let's take this into the evening. That's going to be along this warm front. We could have a isolated tornado risk there, scattered potential for high wind, and numerous storms all throughout the northern plains from Kansas to Montana and North Dakota. Those could extend even into parts of Idaho. Across the plains themselves, Colorado looking for temperatures up into the 100s. The hot spots, Pueblo with 103, Glendive up to 102. Pretty ironic that eastern Montana will be 10 degrees hotter than Austin, San Antonio, or Houston. Well, one place that's not cold is Phoenix. They're going to be peaking on that heat 118 for tomorrow at Phoenix in Yuma. That would be their hottest day this year. Can you imagine living there? That's like stepping outside the Venera space probe onto Venus. Well, it's probably all about that wintertime weather, right? Tucson, 110 for tomorrow, 115 for Palm Springs. Death Valley, 122, another place we probably don't want to be living. For Thursday, looks like an overnight MCS moving through the Corn Belt, Iowa into Illinois. Peak heating shows... More storms for the Central Plains, Nebraska, and Kansas. We're likely looking at a large increase in severe weather, a slight risk. From Goodland to Des Moines and Rapid City, basically in this area, that includes Omaha, much of Nebraska, likely looking at large hail, high wind. But due to localized backing and a 40-knot low-level jet, a few of those storms could be capable of producing tornadic cells. Could also see some severe storms up into eastern North Dakota. The heat breaks in the northern plains with this cold front coming south, 80s in Montana, low 90s in the lower plains. In the central U.S., we still hold on to 100s in Kansas and Colorado, 100 from Liberal to Pueblo. And we start backing off on that heat down to 114 at Phoenix. A little bit cooler coming up for late in the week. Then going into Friday, overnight storms once again in Iowa. Tis that time of year, and the front sweeps through. More storm chances. Uh, did we skip a frame? Yeah, we're missing the 7 p.m. map. Anyway, plenty of storms up there in the north-central U.S. Widespread 70s further to the west, low to mid-90s across Texas, and temperatures in the southwest mostly between 100 and 110. And we'll go on into the weekend. Looks like a rainy pattern for the Great Lakes on Saturday. Nice temperatures continue in the north-central U.S. And we start to see the monsoon increasing over the weekend, affecting initially the Douglas, Deming, El Paso area, and the higher elevations of eastern Arizona and New Mexico. Then for the rest of the period, another cold front moving through the north-central U.S., not coming very far south, maybe down to I-40, and another Pacific system moving through the northwestern U.S. So very typical weather for this time of July. And that will do it for this episode of Forecast Lab. I apologize I've not been able to do the mini lessons because we are behind schedule again. I'll try to get that rectified on Friday and plan out some materials. So hopefully you'll stick around and subscribe to make sure you receive that video. Hope you have a great middle of your week and we'll see you back here in a few days. Bye-bye.